I invite you to bow with me as I pray the 19th Psalm. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O God, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. This topic today is not one I would have chosen for pop culture. Um, As I solicited feedback from folks about trends and things in pop culture that people were interested in, um, I chose the most popular ones. Fitting, yes? And a repeated theme that you all listed was religious extremism or, or something similar to that, religious fanatics or the end of the world or other things um, that came back with a similar theme. And when I think of pop culture, I'm usually thinking of the non-religious world generally. But it is true that um, religion makes it into the pop culture presence pretty much only when people are crazy. And that really warms my heart because there's nothing I want more than religion to be trotted around, trotted around, than when people look at it and shake their head and say, who could be a part of any of that? And unfortunately, I think that's true. I think um, most regular religion, regular religion, what is that? flies under the radar screen, and it's not a part of pop culture. So what you get when you get, when religion makes, makes it public, it is either what I would call a really pathetic civic religion that I think is fairly vacuous generally, or it's this radical extremism that people tend not to believe. Well, Jesus had this, I, I, it comforts me to know Jesus had the same problem. <laughs> and this passage uh, from John is very symbolic of what Jesus was dealing with of, with religious fanatics of the day and similar to what we struggle with even now. So this is from the Gospel of John. I would invite you to stand as you are able for the reading of the Holy Gospel. And hear anew this familiar story. When each of the disciples had gone home, Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning he came again to the temple. All the people came to him and he sat down and began to teach them. Now the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery. And making her stand before all of them, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in the very act of committing adultery. Now the law of Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. Now what do you say? And they said this to test him, so they might have some charge to bring against him. And Jesus knelt down and wrote with his finger on the ground. And when they kept on questioning him, he finally straightened up and said to them, Let anyone who is without sin cast the first stone. And once again he knelt down and began writing in the dirt. When they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the elders. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. And as he stood up, he said to her, Woman, where did everybody go? Has no one condemned you? She said, No, no one, sir. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go your way and do not sin anymore. Here ends this reading. Amen. Please be seated. I appreciated Reverend Ilga pointing out that they only arrested the woman. They caught her in the act. Was she alone? Apparently not. But you have to remember in the Old Testament, women are property. Did I hear an amen? Unlikely, yes? Women are property, and women committing such sin should be put to death. The men? It hasn't been that many years in this country when the she deserved it phrase in a rape case has finally been dismissed. But for years in this country, 
women were accused of, of causing their own rape. Dressing wrong, being in the wrong place. Should have known better. Poor man, he, he can't help himself. It's humiliating, isn't it? But here are the religious extremists of the day, predictably hypocritical, predictably only holding accountable the one that they thought they could get away with. And I think this happens all the time. I think we only punish the people we think we can get away with punishing. And we don't hold accountable the people that we think are too powerful. And this kind of religious fanaticism or extremism of wanting to put someone to death. I mean, think about this. Putting someone to death for this kind of sin. Friends, if we lined up members of Congress and stoned to death every adulterer, would we have a quorum? I mean, really, would we be able to hold the next meeting? And yet our, our nation is founded on the Bible. Yes and no. We also have a growing tendency, and frankly not growing fast enough, to grace. And, and how has the message of grace been missed? When, when in our country we were burning witches at the stake, mostly women, right? When we were doing all these atrocities, where, where was the grace? When, when, when lynching people of a different color was legal in this country, where, where, was the, where was Jesus' grace? Where was the compassion? Where was the notion when Jesus reminded them and said, which among you has never done anything wrong? You get to throw the first stone. Now there's a little known story that goes alongside this. It's actually not in the scriptures that when Jesus said, let you who was without sin cast the first stone, and a woman stood up and heaved a rock at the lady and hit her right in the head. And Jesus said, come on, mom, I'm trying to make a point. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> yeah, I love that. Clearly, that didn't make the final cut for the book of John. But you know, I look at the, when, when religion finally makes the news in this country, um, it's when I was flying into Oakland a few years ago, and um, it was, the world was about to end. I was flying in on Friday, it was going to end the next day. And there were billboards all over Oakland, and I guess the guy who had predicted the end of the world, it was his second round, his second try. Um, I think he had the third strike six months later. But he's still on the air. He had predicted the end of the world, and um, everyone had to get right with Jesus, or else. And so I, I remember flying in, and there were billboards. As we were taxiing down the runway, there were billboards up saying, May 16th, it's over. And I got out and was, went to my rental car place. And there was a guy that had a hat that said, the end of the world, May 16th. And he had the t-shirt. And he was renting a car. And so after he walked away, I asked the lady, I said, if the world ends, do I have to bring it back? But I think they had been trained for this occasion because she didn't even look up. She just filled out the paperwork and passed it forward for me to sign. And then there was another, there was a great article in the paper and billboards that said the Bay Area, you know, this is San Francisco, Oakland, right? So, which I don't think is a hugely religious area, generally. And you had the, these banners that said the Bay Area atheists are hosting an end of the world party May 16th and, barring something unforeseen, May 17th as well. I mean, you laugh or you cry, right? But they interviewed some people who had driven there, and there was a there was a guy, and he had his he was a trucker, 
And he had packed his five kids in the car with his wife. And they'd sold everything they had. And they drove to Oakland. And they interviewed him and they said, well, are, are you disappointed? And he said, well, yes. He said, but um, we, we felt like this was our only chance. That this world is so hard that we just didn't think we could make it any longer. So we came hoping that it was coming to an end. You know, I think religious fanaticism, re religious extremism is born of this level of human despair. A level of human despair and brokenness that is, that is, is so painful, we, we often look away from it. I mean, is it, is it any wonder that when we cry, we cry best with our eyes closed because we can't stay, stand to look ahead? Is it, is it any wonder that when we, when we pray and are in despair, we look down and, and we put our, our hands over our face? Is, is it any wonder that in the times of life when things are the worst, we can't even bear to look at it? We can't even bear to think about it. There is a level of brokenness in this world, in our lives, that is so real and so painful that we turn away instinctively from it. That's why when we, when we see someone who's homeless on the street with a sign, sometimes we don't want to make eye contact, right? We just want to look away from... We can't even imagine how many things have to go wrong before we too could end up there. You know, when we, when we, see, when we see brokenness in the world, um, we, um, we just have instinctively an opportunity to turn away. And I think there's a, a time when, uh, Gerald, Ulrich, Gerald and Julie, could you come forward, please? I give thanks for people who know what to do and respond with compassion. And I think we try to insulate ourselves, do we not, even in our religious worship, from the brokenness of the world. And when the brokenness intrudes, we're reminded of what Jesus was thinking about when he looked down at the dirt and drew. I mean, he couldn't even look up at the people who were accusing this woman, thinking about how broken they were. And if Jesus knows all of our hearts, imagine these men who came forward to accuse this woman, Jesus could see through them and knew exactly what was on their heart, the despair and the brokenness. Friends, when I see people committing to religious extremism, I believe it's born out of that same brokenness that we all somehow try to live through day to day. And yet, when it's so great, people move to an extreme that is extraordinary. I saw a documentary on uh, people who were recruited by Al-Qaeda uh, to do suicide bombings. You know, you'd be surprised they're not recruiting people from the wealthiest families in the area. They're not recruiting people from universities. They're recruiting kids who are homeless on the street and promising them the winning of the lottery that this trucker and his family were seeking when they came to, when they came to Oakland hoping the world would come to an end. They tell people that you're going to have riches in heaven. And then when these broken people blow up buses, with themselves. Can you imagine a level of brokenness and despair? Can you imagine looking at the world as so broken that you would strap explosives to yourself and destroy other people? I mean, we can't even understand that level of brokenness, and yet it's so real 
in so many parts of the world. When you have a religious brokenness where um, for political and religious reasons someone will walk into a church and, and shoot a doctor dead in the name of Jesus, shoot a doctor dead in church, we like to think that religious fanaticism only belongs to Muslim countries, right? And we forget that religious fanaticism is all cut from the same cloth, whether it's Jewish, Christian, Muslim. We also know that there's often in religious fanaticism there's mental health issues. And relig the religious fanaticism has a way of filling a void in someone who's not thinking right very clearly. Many times people who kill others hear voices that tell them that they need to do this. And we know that that's not God speaking, but it's something else. I, I think of my um, ordination service um, when in uh, Baldwin, Kansas at annual conference. And because our bishop had lost two sons, two gay sons to AIDS, they died in the early 90s, that Fred Phelps felt like every time our bishop did something, he should come and bring some signs. So I have my cousins who are from, who are from the rest of the world. You know, I have cousins who don't, aren't in church and, and really don't understand it, don't really care about it. They don't really have a bad attitude about it, they, you know, whatever. But they come to my ordination service because they love me. And they see this dude outside. And they're like, who is that? <laughs> and we're like, well, welcome to Kansas. You know, we're sort of used to crazy around here. You know, we, we see it so regularly, we're not even phased by it. I mean, I remember driving down the streets of Topeka. You drive down the streets of Topeka and he's out picking in some church every weekend. And then he shows up to your ordination service, you go, well. But people from the regular world <laughs> see this kind of religious fanaticism where everybody's going to die. God hates everybody pretty much but me or us, my small group. This is my problem with Hell Night that's going on across the street. It's starting up and hundreds of children are going to be told, mostly youth, are going to be told that God is so angry with the world that pretty much everybody's going to burn in hell unless you become a religious fanatic. Uh, not just any religious, being a Muslim religious fanatic would not help you over there. You would need to be a, a fundamentalist Christian religious fanatic or you're going to burn in hell. I think there, I think it preys on a human brokenness of people wanting to be filled. I think, I think people take advantage of the brokenness of humanity. They, they milk people for their money. People sell everything and give it to, I'll say we've had a lot of fundraisers here and you might get tired of the fundraisers at Trinity, not as tired as I am of them. But I can say we've never sent out a letter that said, give everything you own to the church or you're gonna go to hell. Now, now, I'm telling you, it might get to that point, but it hasn't yet. <laughs> I don't think it would work. But this religious fanaticism, when it shows up on the tabloids of the world coming in, and I guess it's coming up this year, the Mayan calendar ran out of ink. You know, the archaeologist found another Mayan calendar that actually extends longer. Never mind that. I have a friend, a pastor in town, who's, um, it's also his birthday. I think it's December 31st. I think it's his, bir it's his birthday, so he's having an end of the world party for his birthday that I'm going to. He's Presbyterian, so he's. I want to encourage us, because the religious fanaticism has a cost to uh, to. to to those of us in mainstream Christianity. The cost to us in mainstream Christianity is number one, it makes regular people think religious people are lunatics. And they look at the popular culture of what makes it into the press of religion and they think, I don't want anything to do with that. I don't want anything to do 
with someone who's taking all of people's money to say the world's coming to an end. I don't want anything to do with a God who's so angry that everybody but a certain small group of people are going to burn in hell. I don't want to be a part of a religious organization where people are blowing themselves up. I don't want to be a part of a religion that is empty and angry and broken. And you know what? I don't either. But it's hard to compete with the headlines, isn't it? Because lunacy has a headline in pop culture that regular people just don't make. And our challenge is the same challenge Jesus had, which is when people want to be extreme in their religion, most of us just want to turn off the TV. And I know that's how I feel. And I wonder if that's how you feel too. And I wonder if that's why it made it onto the list of pop culture items. In a minute, I'm going to invite us to come forward for communion. A Holy Communion, we celebrate it the first Sunday of every month. Um, and I want, to, I want to just say a little bit about um, an invitation as you come to communion today to think about it. Jesus' message of love, of saying, you know, the rules are important, but they're not worth killing each other over. I mean, that's what he said, isn't it? That the rules are important. There's a bunch of rules. Those matter. But the point of them is, is to treat people well. If you're using the rules to treat people badly, those really aren't the rules that we're talking about. And so a lot of the times, religion uses the rules to exclude people or to break people down or to push people away. And so we have whole groups of people historically that have been pushed away from the church because they're not following the right rules. And this woman in the scripture would be a perfect example. Um, she had been caught in the act of adultery. And so she is no longer worthy of God's love, according to the religious leaders at the time. And I get really tired of that, because that still happens all the time now. The religious extremists of the day could not tolerate Jesus offering a message of grace. And so they had him put to death, which is pretty extremist in its own right. That Jesus died at the hands of the religious extremists of his own day. And they didn't, they didn't um, assassinate him. They didn't have a suicide bombing. They didn't um, kill him while he was in the temple. Instead, they, they uh, made up a reason for his arrest. And they had the Romans crucify him and put him to death. And Jesus' words on the cross, you would think, would have been... <laughs> more akin to Arnold Schwarzenegger's I'll be back and I'm going to get every one of you rotten people for doing this to me. And contrary to what would make a good movie I was going to yeah, never mind. instead Jesus just says these, these very anti-climatic words. He says Father forgive them because these fanatics have no idea what they're doing. And he's asking God to love the people who are the most broken. He's asking God to love the people who are, whose brokenness has, has enough space for a lot of hate. He's asking God to, to love people who are being absolutely offensive in the way they talk, in the way they act, in the way they live. I have a really hard time, I'll make a confession today, I have a really hard time loving the religious fanatics who seem to be filled with hate. I don't know about you, but when I see it, the first thought in coming to my mind has not historically been, Father, forgive them. When I see Fred Phelps signs, the first words out of my mouth historically have not been, Father, forgive him, for he knows not what he does. But one of the things, as I've been working on this sermon this week, is one of the things I want to do for myself is when I see a news article about someone blowing up a bus, I want to pray that prayer. 
Father, forgive them. They don't really know what they're doing. When I see someone else predicting the end of the world and taking advantage of people who, who are really broken and hurting, I want to ask God to forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. The next time I go to a United Methodist general conference and I hear people spouting really hateful things about my brothers and sisters in Christ, I want to pray the prayer, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. My invitation as we come forward for communion today is to come with that forgiving spirit, to come with that spirit of love and joy, a spirit that, that others aren't able to muster right now, and it's hard for us to muster. To come forward with that intention as we receive the communion of Jesus' body and blood that has been broken for us at the hands of some lunatics, religious lunatics, who took Jesus' life. To receive that gift, that blessing of forgiveness, to change our own hearts for how we respond. Because there's so much brokenness out in the world. My prayer for me and for you is that we can respond with that Christ-like love and reach out to folks who are caught up in it and let them know that God loves them and God calls them to a word of grace and hope and peace. Will you pray with me? Good and gracious God, the, um, the brokenness of our world, of our lives, leaves us vulnerable to extreme action, to extreme belief. And Lord, the greater the poverty, the greater the mental illness, Lord, the greater the strife, the greater the hurt, the greater the loss, the greater susceptibility we have to believing things that are far from your calling for us. Lord, help us to be a part of healing the world, of healing the brokenness, of healing the hurt, so that folks might feel and experience your grace for themselves. Because until we receive that grace in our own lives, we have nothing graceful to share with others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I invite us to